Experiment 17, Kinetics, Determination of the Order of a Reaction. What is chemical kinetics? Chemical kinetics is the study of the rates of chemical reactions. The rate of a chemical reaction describes how fast a reaction proceeds. Basically, how quickly are reactants consumed and products produced? It's a measure of the same point whether we look at it in terms of reactants being consumed or products being produced, kind of like a glass being half full or half empty. It's still the same amount of water. Well, whether we look at it in terms of reactants being consumed or products being produced, it's still the same rate. In this experiment, we're looking at the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide catalyzed by iodine ion. The general expression for this reaction of the rate law is rate is equal to some rate constant K times the concentration of hydrogen peroxide to some power X times the concentration of iodine ion to some power Y. So in today's experiment, our goal is to find K, X, and Y. Typically, your rate law is written as the product of your reactants and catalysts raised to some power. So our goal is to find the rate law for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. The rate law will allow one to calculate the rate for any concentration of reactants or catalysts for any point of time if we know the concentration. Uh, we can calculate the rate. But you must realize that rate changes as concentration changes. Rate is an instantaneous rate for a particular point in a reaction based on the concentration at that time. Typically. The brackets typically indicate concentration and molarity. However, in this experiment, we're going to do a slightly different way, and we're not going to do it as molarity, we're going to be doing it as volumes. We'll talk more about that as we go. K is a specific rate constant and is related to a particular reaction at a particular temperature. Okay, so we're trying to find a K for this decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. X and Y are referred to as the order of the reactant. It describes how the reactant concentration affects the rate of the reactions. These values are typically a positive integer, but not always. They can be negative, they can be fractions, but typically what you run into, in, especially in lecture, is some whole number of 0, 1, 2, 3 values. However, in lab, we're probably going to get some strange numbers due to the apparatus we're using. Orders are determined experimentally, not by stoichiometry of the balance equation. The reason is that the reaction may have several steps. Okay? The steps are based on elementary reactions based on collisions. And the balance equation you have is, is based on mole to mole. It's not based on collisions. If reaction takes several steps, then ultimately that slowest step will decide the overall rate of the reaction. Reaction can only go as fast as the slowest step. So, for example, I could have an, a reaction that takes two steps to get the overall equation. There may be a first step, which is A plus A gives me A2, which is an elementary step, which means it's based on collisions. Okay, This may be the slowest step. And then the second step, A2, which was formed in the first step, collides with B to form C. Now, the overall balance equation, when you add these up, gives you your molecular equation of 2A plus B gives me C. But as you can see in this two-step mechanism, A never actually collides with B. Most stoichiometry, I need two A's for every one B for the reaction to go, but it's not a case of two A and one B colliding to form C. A plus A makes A2, then A2 reacts with B to form the C. So the overall rate equation here is going to be based on the slowest step. So this step one is what's going to dictate Step one is what's going to dictate. Step one is going to dictate the overall order of reaction. So, since this is an elementary reaction, I can write rate is equal to some constant k, concentration of A squared based on the one, two moles of A in that reaction. I can write it directly from the equation because it's an elementary equation. Okay, it's an elementary equation. Stoichiometry, I cannot, <clears throat> no, I cannot write the rate law straight from the stoichiometry equation. Um, 
because it's not based on collisions. This is why when you do some calculations of your rate laws, you may not find a species in your actual overall rate equation, and as in this example, B wouldn't be there, be a zero order because it has no effect on rate. What's affecting the rate is that slowest step, which is A colliding with A. The order of a reactant is determined by the effect changing the con reaction concentration has on rate. If you change the concentration of reactant and the react and the rate remains the same, then it's a zero order. Okay, that means that the species has to be present for the reaction to go, but it has no effect on rate. So in essence, what we're saying is that if I double the concentration of something to the power of that 2 times the rate, I get the rate. Well, the only way that I could double it times the rate and I still get rate is it has to be 0. Anything to the 0 order is 1. So 2 to the 0 is 1 times rate, which gives me rate. If I triple it and the rate stayed the same, well, it's 3 to the 0 order, which is 1, gives me rate. If I change the concentration to react and, and the rate changes the same, then it's first order. There's a linear relationship. So what you're looking at here is 2 to some power time rate gives me 2 times the rate. Well, that would be to the first order. 2 to the first gives me 2. If I do triple the concentration and the rate triples, then the first order again, 3 to the first power times the rate gives me 3 times the rate. If I change the concentration to react and, and the rate changes to the square, meaning the second order, then we're looking at <clears throat> the following. Say I double the concentration and the rate quadruples four times, and then the square is happening at a 2 to the 2. Gives me 4. If I triple the concentration, I get a 9 fold on the rate, then I got the square happening. 3 squared is equal to 9. If you're following what I'm saying, then, and I ask you what happens if it's a third order, let's say I double the concentration of something, and it's a third order, what should happen to the rate? Well, 2 to the third power, or in other words, 8 times the rate. Now, we also calculate the overall order reaction, which basically equals the sum of all the orders. So you add up all the orders to get the overall order. So in this case, it'd be x plus y plus whatever it gives me the overall order. Now, how do we determine the order if I cannot take it from the balance equation? If it's not based on that stoichiometry equation, how do I do it? Well, I collect data carefully with a well-designed experiment. Basically, I will vary the concentration of reactants in such a manner that allows you to determine the order by eliminating components. We hold some species constant while we're changing others. Therefore, you know any change in rate is because of that species being changed. And then we can determine the order that way. Here's some data. I got A plus B gives me products, P. Um, so the rate law, the generic rate law, would be rate is equal to some constant K times the concentration of A to the X times the concentration of B to the Y, basically your reactants. I do the experiment. I have experiment one. I have concentration of A, 1 molarity, B, 1 molarity, and I measure the rate to be 1 molarity. Then I do experiment 2, 1 molarity, 2 molarity for B, and a 2 molarity per second for the rate. Then experiment 3, I run it, and I got 2 molarity for A, 1 for B, measure the rate, it's 8 molarities per second. So now I'll take this data and I can look at it to determine the order. So I can do this by inspection, if it's nice numbers, which we're going to do. Or you can do it by the initial rate method, which I'll show you on the next slide. So what I'm looking for here is to look at the experimental data and see if I can find a way uh, uh, to compare in two experiments that I leave something constant, I vary something else, which will dictate what happens to the rate. Looking at this, if I look at experiment one and two, you can see that my concentration of A did not change. So any effect that A was adding to the rate in the first experiment, it added the same amount to the rate in the second experiment, okay, in the first experiment to the second experiment. But notice that in B, I doubled the concentration. So if I held A constant and it affected the rate the same in experiment one and experiment two, then any change in the rate would have to be due to B being changed in concentration. Notice that I doubled the concentration of B. What happened to the rate there? 
It also doubled, that's a linear relationship, so 2 to the first power happened to the rate. So therefore, it is a first order um, reactant for B. So compare an experiment 1 and 2, B doubles, the rate doubles, the linear effect, therefore Y is equal to 1. It's a first order in respect to B. Now, let's talk about trying to solve for the X now. I'm looking for a case where B is held constant. Okay, it doesn't have to be because now I know what the order is for B, but it makes it a lot easier if it does cancel out. And if I look at that, I'll look at experiment one and experiment three. I see that my concentration of B stayed the same. So any effect it has to the rate will be contributing the same. Then I'll look at concentration of A, which I doubled. Okay, what happened to the rate? Well, the eight went the rate went eightfold, okay, eight times. So how can I talk about 2 to, and get into 8? Well, 2 to what power will give me 8? That's to the cubed. Okay, so we have a third order with respect of our x for our concentration of A. So comparing experiment 1 and experiment 3, A doubles and the rate is 8-fold. If we have a cube effect, so our x is equal to 3, it's third order overall for our reactant of A. So that gives me a rate law then as following. Rate is equal to some constant k, concentration of a to the cubed, and b to the first. This is how you do it by inspection. Now, nice, sometimes you don't have nice numbers, which I'll show you how to do in the next slide. Now, if I wanted to get the overall rate equation, I still got to figure out k. So then I would take one set of data and plug in those values and solve for the k, which we'll do that later on. So let's show you now how to do this with initial rate method. <clears throat> well, how we're going to do this is we're going to write the rate law of one set of data to compare that to the rate law of another set of data and compare the numbers in solve for x and y. We're going to do it the same way. I'm going to select experiments where I get one of the species to cancel out. And the other thing I'm going to do is I tend to write the rate with the larger number in the numerator compared to the rate with the smaller one in the denominator. The reason I do that is that gives me whole numbers to deal with. I can do that in my head a little easier than I can with fractions. Okay, You can get the same answer if you put the smaller one on top. It just means you got to deal with decimals and fractions. I'd rather go the other way. So for this part of the initial rate, I'm just going to show you one calculation. I'm not going to do both. Let's look at trying to solve for our a, our x, uh, power x. What is x? So doing that, I will look at this and I'll say, I'm going to take experiment one and compare that to experiment three because my B concentrations will cancel out. So then I can see what the effect of A is on rate. So then I'll write my rate law. My experimental three rate law, rate is equal to K times some concentration of A, the third group of experiment to the X and B third experiment to the y divided by rate 1 equal to k, a1 to the x, and b1 to the y. Plug in those values, okay, and I get my, see that my concentrations molarity per second cancels, my molarities cancel. My whole one molarity to the y and one molarity to the y, it doesn't matter what y is, it's going to cancel out, because it doesn't matter what that factor is. So then I end up with a case of having 8 is equal to uh, 2 to the x. My k is also canceled out. Now, I can look at that and say, oh, x must be 3. 2 to the 3 gives me 8, but maybe I can't see that. If I can't, well, then what I can do is take the log of both sides. So I'll take the log of 8 and the log of 2 to the x. Mathematically, by definition, that x can then come in front of that and makes it x log of 2. So then I can divide by log of 2 on both sides. And then I get x is equal to the log of 8 divided by the log of 2, which is equal to 3. Now, one thing to keep in mind, calculation-wise, it is the log of 8, that numeric value, divided by the log of 2, that numeric value. You cannot cancel logs. You cannot divide 2 into 8. You've got to take the numerator value and divide the denominator value. So, we do the same thing if you wanted for the... Um, the y, except you compare experiment 1 and 2, and you would come up with what we did before, y is equal to 1. Now once you have your x and y's, you got to solve for k, so let's talk about solving for k. If 
For that, what we do is we would use any set of data experiment. I'm going to choose three, okay, but you can use any set. And theoretically, you should get the same K no matter what set you use. So then I'll plug that data in. Right. My third equation is equal to K A3 to the X and A B3 to the Y. Plug in my rate, plug in my concentrations for A and B. Then do my arithmetic. That means I'm going to multiply or divide through by two molarity cubed and one molarity. You get it to the other side. Uh, one thing to realize here, this is two molarity cubed. That means the two is cubed as well as the molarity is cubed. That whole thing is cubed, which gets us... 8 molarities per second is 8 molarity cubed, time 1 molarity is equal to K. Now you do your canceling of the units in your math, it would be 8 divided by 8, 8 divided by 1. Uh, one of these molarities will cancel. One of these molarities will cancel with this molarity, which gives me 2 molarities. So that will then give me 1 per second over molarity cubed. Two molarities into one molarity, molarity cubed is equal to K. Mathematically, if something's in the denominator, I can I can rewrite that as molarity minus three if I want, meaning it's in the denominator. So we we'll go ahead and write that as K is equal to one molarity minus three seconds minus one. Which gets me in the overall rate equation. Rate is equal to one molarity. Uh, minus 3 seconds minus 1, A to the cubed, B. And the overall order then will be your 3 plus your understood 1, which is the fourth order. So now if I know the concentration of A and B of any time, then I can figure out the rate of the experiment. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that we have nice simple conversions here to uh, cancel out units for the molarity. But life is not always nice and simple with units, especially in this experiment you're going to do, experiment 17. So you need to think about what are we actually doing when I cancel units? When I say molarity cancels with one of these and makes that a 2, what am I doing there? Well, in essence, you're doing a little bit of arithmetic. Okay, what you're saying is, is that molarity to the first, which is coming from the numerator, Okay, minus 3 is coming from the denom denominator, okay, it's going to denominator, and that minus 1 is coming from that molarity which is in the denominator, which gives me an overall minus 3 charge, minus 3 power. So, if you don't have nice numbers to deal with, say you're dealing with fractions, how would you deal with that? Here's an example, let's say I had molarity to the 0.25 divided by molarity to 0.5, Time the molarity to the 0.85. Well, you're just doing a little bit of arithmetic. We're saying I got 0.25 since it's in the numerator, minus 0.5 since it's in the denominator, minus another 0.85 since that's in the denominator, which gives me an overall molarity of a negative 1.10. So in essence, we're looking at molarity to the negative 1.10. So that's how you're dealing with units if you're dealing with things that are, nice, that are not nice whole numbers that cancel out. All right, in today's experiment, on experiment 17, the rate of your hydrogen peroxide decomposition will be determined by plotting the volume of your oxygen gas generated versus time. So we're going to figure out the rate of the experiment by doing a plot. We're going to have our, on our y-axis, it's going to be the volume of your oxygen gas generated. We're following that oxygen gas being generated, figuring out how much that is at a particular time. Plotting that data, and that gives us our rate. Okay, that's the rate of that decomposition. We're following the volume of oxygen that's being produced. We'll do three different experiments, but only once each. Okay, so there is no precision today. We're going to do three different experiments, get our rates for the three different experiments. So we're doing no precision today. We've got three individual experiments that we're doing. These experiments will be set up as follows. Experiment one, you will take 10 milliliters of potassium iodide, 15 of water, and 5 of hydrogen peroxide, and run your experiment. Okay, measuring your oxygen, and then you will take that data, and you have your volume of O2 being generated in your time, and you get some plot. Then the slope of that line, okay, will give me my rate. 
Okay, so the slope of that line is going to give me my rate. Then you can do a second experiment, 20 milliliters of KI, 5 water, 5 hydrogen peroxide. Run the experiment, measure your volume of oxygen versus time again. Okay, the slope of that line is going to give me my rate for the second experiment. Okay, so this is rate 1, this would be my rate 2. And then you're going to do it a third time. 10 milliliters of KI, 10 of water, 10 of hydrogen peroxide. Once again, do a plot. Okay, do another plot. And that slope is going to give me my rate 3. Now notice that in this experiment that the volumes all add up to 30. In experiment 1, that's 30 milliliters. Okay, experiment 2, that's 30 milliliters. All the volumes are the same. It's a reason we did it that way. It's that way we don't have to worry about calculating concentration. As I said earlier, typically the brackets make concentration. We're going to do this on the volume basis because that volume is proportional to the concentration change because of the way that we set up the experiment. So we're going to use this data just like we just showed you a slide ago. Okay, instead of doing it by concentration, we're going to look at the volumes and say, oh, here I doubled the concentration of my Ki. My concentration of my hydrogen peroxide stayed the same. What happened to the change in those slopes, our rates? Okay, and figure out the order. Then do the same thing for experimental one and three. Okay, one and three. You can see my volume stayed the same for Ki. You can see my hydrogen peroxide doubled. What happened to the slope change between experiment one and three? Same procedure except we're doing it on a volume basis. The water here doesn't really mean anything. This part right here is just keeping the volume, the concentration the same. So, okay, by keeping the total volume the same. So we comparing. We're basically comparing. We're comparing the hydrogen and peroxide to the Ki is what we're doing, and comparing that to see what happens to the the slope or the rate. Now each group only needs about 50 mils of Ki to do this experiment, and your hydrogen and peroxide will be given out by the TA as needed. Okay, they will you cut, raise your hand and they come bring it to you when you need it. Those are the only two reactants involved in this reaction. Page 117 describes how the experiment will be conducted. Some important points about that experiment. First off, the level of the burette and the drying tube must be equal for your readings. Okay, so you want to raise that drying tube up to the level of the burette when you make your reading. You can dump out excess water. That water can, can overflow as your experiment's going, so you can dump some of that out. You want to make sure all the air bubbles are out before you start the experiment. You want to check for leaks, okay, as it describes in the manual. You want to add your hydrogen peroxide just before you're ready to do an experiment. Don't just add it and then wait a while to get started. You want to be ready to do your experiment when you get that. Once you get your hydrogen peroxide in there, then you're basically on the reaction is going to start. Last, you wait one or two milliliters before you call time zero. It doesn't matter when you call it time zero. We're looking at your change in volume over change in time. So therefore, it doesn't matter what we call time zero. So let your reaction go a minute or two. Then once you see it's working, then go and call it time zero. And you read whatever is on the burette at that moment and go on from there. So what you're going to do is collect some data over time. So you're going to have at time zero, whatever that may be, you let them go and you want to pick a nice round number so you may wait till the burette gets to like two and say once it hits two milliliters I'm going to call that time zero. So as it hits it say time zero. Okay then let it go. Then you're going to wait a minute and after a minute you're going to read on the burette again what it is. Okay so you can see the difference between what time zero was in one minute is 2.10 that is my cumulative volume. Okay I start off at zero okay because we called that zero. Then we wait two minutes. Then what we're trying to do at that point is say, okay, how much did it change since time zero? Well, 6.15 at time two minus the two tells me that there's 4.15 milliliters have changed since that time zero, which we call time zero. Then 
you wait three minutes. Okay, at three minutes, you're comparing that back to that initial reading of what we said was time zero. So 8.3 minus 2 gives you 6.3, and so on and so forth. Then what you're going to do is you're going to do a plot, and your plot's going to be your cumulative volume, which is your y-axis, okay, versus your time, which is your x-axis. So you're plotting your cumulative and time, and cumulative and time, okay, all those data points of what you're plotting, and you're going to get your plot, which this is your volume of O2 versus time, and get a plot. Okay, so you have your zero, zero point, and then the next point will be at one minute and some volume, okay, etc. Now notice there's no standard deviation in this experiment because we're doing three different experiments. Okay, we don't have several runs of a particular experiment. <clears throat> then what you can do is do a plot, okay, you're going to plot this in your lab notebook, okay. We're going to have to give a title to the graph, okay, notice I already told you what to title it, rate, is the rate of decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. We don't use Y versus X because that doesn't tell us anything. Uh, you need to give some information to tell me what that graph is telling me, okay. So you give a title that gives a purpose of the graph. What am I supposed to get out of the graph? Y and X doesn't mean anything, but together they give me some information. And in this particular experiment, that Y versus X is telling me the rate of the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. So the title has to mean something. I want any graph you draw to give me a title that means something. Um, you also need to plot your data. Okay, When you plot your data, make sure you do different symbols for each one of your three different experiments. Now for you, you may want to do an X, a circle, and a square or something, okay? But give me some legend that tells me what your data is and on each one for which experiment. So you're going to do one plot that has three different lines on it, okay? One graph that has three different lines on it for each different experiment. Uh, you're also going to draw your best line. Now best line does not mean connected dots. Best line means if you have data points, drawing the best line that connects as best you can to all data points. You want to be as close as you can to each data point, okay, drawing your best straight line. But do not connect the dots. To help you draw a best, best line, sometimes you can do is turn your paper flat and look down the edge and you can see uh, where that line is going to draw your best line. Uh, but you do not connect the dots, you're drawing a line that's closest to all points as possible. Um, when you're drawing your best line, zero, zero is a point, okay, but do not weigh that heavily. Do not make a line go through zero, zero. It is just one point like any other point, okay? So you're just taking that into account of where to do it. Notice that with these two lines, we're not going through zero, but this one happened to go through zero. I do not force it through zero, okay? It only goes through zero if it goes right through it, okay? That's just like any other point. I'm just weighing that and drawing the best line that I can as one of those points. You want a large graph, okay? If you got a piece of paper, you don't want your graph to be right here, okay? You want your graph to be over as much of the paper as you can. You want a large graph, that way you get a better scale on that graph, at least three-fourths of the page. So with graphing, you must have a descriptive title. You must label both the axis with units. Okay, you may recall, go back. Okay, I didn't mention that, but I gotta label my y-axis and my x-axis of what it is and what are the units. Okay, I gotta have both on there. Uh, I want a large graph over the majority of the page. So that means select an axis inc increment, which allows for this. And give me, a, I give you an example of how to decide that. Say you counted across your x-axis and there was 30 blocks for time. Okay, and you had recorded your data, and it was five minutes of data. Well, let's get a nice number per block, okay, of how many minutes that is. So I take my five minutes, which is my data, divided by my number of blocks, which is 30 I counted, which tells me I need about 0.16 minutes per block to use the entire graph page. 
Now, I don't want to do in increments of 0.16. That gets a little bit difficult. So I'm going to do now is round that to a nice round number that I can count easily. Okay, well, what can we count easily? Well, 0.2, 0.2, 0.4, 0.6, 0.8. That's real easy. So I'll change that 0.16 minutes per block to 0.2 per minute. Uh, minutes per block and then do that. So that would mean I'm going to use about three-fourths of the graph, okay, which is good. Okay, I just don't want it real small. I want to use about three-fourths or more. And you do the same thing for the Y. What is your scale of Y? Okay, how much volume milliliters do you have? Divide that by the number of blocks on your Y axis. Come up with some number and then round it to a nice round number that you can count easily. You also need to put a legend uh, explaining the data, meaning your experimental one is X, your experimental two is squares, your experimental three is a star, whatever that case may be. Um, and do not use colors because you turn it into carbon copy. Colors don't help me. Okay, so making it red, blue, or green, I won't see that on a carbon copy. Everything's blue. Okay, so I need little marks, okay, squares, etc. Then you draw your best line, which is not connecting the dots, and do not force through zero. Okay, it may be a data point, but do not force it. Do not weigh that more. And once you do your plot, then you got to do the slope of each line, of each one of those experiments, to refresh your memory on slope. That is your rise over run, which is your change in y over change in x, which is change in milliliters over change in time for us which is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, which gives us our rate, which is change in milliliters over change in minutes. Now, when you're picking your slope points, you pick points on the line, not your data points. You do not use your data points. You draw your best line if you have your graph, and here's my data points, and here's my best line, okay? I'm going to pick a point on the line and a point on the line and use that for my x and y values okay i am not going to select an, a data point okay because that's not all i drew my best line i want two points on the line to do my slope uh, to determine my slope and once i have that slope that slope is what we call an rate. if we do an experimental one it's experimental one That's rate one. If I do a slope of the accept second data uh, set, then that's going to be rate two, etc. And then we compare those to figure out our ORs. Now, notice that our rate has units of milliliters per minute. That's not what you did in lecture class. You did it in concentration per minute. So let's talk a couple of minutes about how I can do this versus on volume versus concentration. In this experiment, we're using volume instead of concentration in our in our rate unit. Notice in the experiment that the total volume is held constant to 30 milliliters in every experiment. We do that by having the volume in water change to assure that this is occurring. This means that because of the way the experiment is designed, that the original concentration of Ki and hydrogen peroxide and the total volume cancel out, leaving the volume of the solution the only variable. So the only thing really changing is the volume of that substance, okay, because the concentration is being held constant based on that uh, total volume of the liquid being added with that water. So looking at that, the concentration of your Ki in experiment one, I had 0.1 molarity of Ki times 10 milliliters divided by the total volume. In essence, what I'm doing here is CV is equal to CV. Okay, so I have my concentration of my potassium iodide, my volume of potassium iodide divided by the total volume, which we hold in constant at 30. That gives me some concentration of Ki for the first experiment. Then I go on to the second experiment. Okay, I have the same concentration of the Ki. I've doubled the volume, which is 20 milliliters. I divide that by the total volume, which is still 30, and I get a second concentration of Ki for the second experiment. Well, what's really varying between experiment one and experiment two? Well, you can see the concentration of Ki stayed the same. The volume of my total volume stayed the same. So the only variation is that 20 versus that 10. So the concentrations are going to end up being double in the second experiment for potassium iodide because the volume doubled. So there's a proportionality between my volume and the concentration, which allows me then to be able to do my calculation based on volume. So when you compare experiment one to experiment two, what happens is that the concentration of my potassium iodine is equal to 
for the second experiment is double that in the first one because of that volume change. Therefore, in this experiment, our change in milliliters is proportional to our change in concentration, and therefore the slope of the line equals the rate. However, that rate is in units of milliliters per minute, okay, instead of molarity per minute. So that means when you give you K, you got to make sure you give the K units for sure, because you got to show the, the equation involves milliliters and not molarity. The overall goal of this experiment is to report the rate law expression for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. So our goal in this experiment is rate is equal to K, time the concentration of our excuse me, a volume of hydrogen peroxide in milliliters to the X, time my volume of our iodine to the Y. So in this experiment, you're trying to find the K, the X, and the Y, and then report that in this fashion right here. I want to see in the lab report, rate is equal to whatever the K is in its units. Don't forget the units of K. Time the volume of your hydrogen peroxide to some order. Find what that order is. Time the volume of your I minus to some order Y. So you must give the K with units, the X, the Y, and also the overall order, N, the X, and Y. 